Brothers and sisters, welcome back. This is the In My Grow Show. I'm your host, Alex. And I want to thank you once again for taking the time to listen to me, man. I truly do appreciate that. Now, a little later in the show, I am going to talk about how cannabis did in the election. That just happened a few days ago. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about um, IPM during flowering. Uh, Yeah, somebody had a question on Instagram. But first, before that, let's talk about a few things. First of all, why am I in the cab of my truck? Well, um, so right now I'm at Lake Casitas up in Ojai. And I decided since I was out in the woods, I would just record the show. You know, how hard could it be? Well, you know what? It's really windy outside. Turns out to be a lot harder than I imagined. Not really that hard. It's just really windy. And there's a whole bunch of stuff lying around. It's just a uh, terrible sound. So um, instead of packing everything up and going home, I decided, you know what? I'm just going to finish recording the show or just record the show from here. So uh, bear with me while I also get all my notes and everything else together. But you know what? It's not that bad um, because it helps me actually figure out that I can can record the show from the cab of my truck so I can pretty much go anywhere. That's pretty cool. All right, hang tight. I got to open my notes and then, um, yeah, we'll keep talking about a few things. Now, last week was Halloween and Dia de los Muertos. Um, Dia de los Muertos, you know what? We didn't really do anything that much different than we usually do. You know, we built some altars, lit some candles, uh, said hello to our dead relatives and ancestors. Halloween, though, um, yeah, man, it's been kind of interesting. You know, the quarantine basically canceled Halloween also. You know, people were getting pretty creative on what to do for that day. Um, You know, and for me... I've got teenagers, you know, and it's it's all about really just kind of keeping them in the normalcy of trying to keep those traditions going, you know, just something also to make them feel like, you know, they can get together with friends. So, you know, what we did was that um, got a couple of our friends together. We carved some pumpkins at our house and then I took them to the uh, miniature golf, man, played a couple of rounds of miniature golfs, had them do a couple of laps in the mini Grand Prix. You know, something, man, just to keep it, you know, just to keep that normalcy going, that camaraderie, that, you know, that that whole sense of being able to hang out with your friends. But um, anyways, yeah, that's how Halloween was for us. I hope it was cool for you. You know, I did wind up with a whole bunch of candy, mostly not because we went anywhere, but mostly because it was on sale at the drugstore the day afterwards. A whole bunch of it, too. And I have a sweet tooth. You know, I really got to watch that. But anyways, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was this um, Peach Ring Live Resin Batter. Well, can't really see that. Wow, that's really blown out. All right, let's see it on this side. Hey, there you go. Anyways, I'll put up a picture of it. Um, But yeah, it is a live resin batter. And uh, thank you once again to Sespe Creek Collective for sending this over. They sent over a little sample. And again, I will put up more pictures of it, but let's see if you can see it. And it is a concentrate. Okay. Uh, no, there you go. There you go. Yeah. And this live resin batter was put together by uh, West Coast Cure. So the peach ring, man, I got to tell you, I, I, I don't do a lot of dabs. I don't do a lot of concentrates. Um, I mostly do them in like social situations. You know, if I'm hanging out with friends, somebody has some dabs, you know, rig. Yeah, I'll do it. Absolutely. It's a really great potent high. It's a great way for me anyways to, to celebrate and party with my friends. Now, the reason and the reason why I don't do dabs myself or a lot of concentrates at home is because I really enjoy smoking flour. And concentrates, you know, things like dabs, they, they really saturate my endocannabinoid system to the point that it really pushes up my tolerance. So when I go back to smoking flour, it just seems like it takes me to, it takes me more flour. I need to smoke more flour in order to get, you know, that, that sense of highness, that, that elevated part. At least for me, that's the way it is, and that's why I don't really do a lot of dabs at home by myself. Now, with that said, um, this peach ring was a beautiful, strong, potent high. Um, it had a taste. It did have a taste of like the peach ring gummy, the sweet like flavor. But it also had this really like 
funky, gassy taste at the end also. It was a great, it was a great taste. I really liked it. And you know what? When I hit it, um, that first hit, you know, it kind of started, like, after a few minutes, like, the back of my left side of my brain started to tingle. And, you know, that high just kind of came over me real quick. Uh, you know, I actually said to myself, I need to sit down. Um, not because I got too high, but because I needed to relax because I was about to take a couple more hits and I should enjoy it. But yeah, this was an awesome flavor. This was an awesome taste. If you love doing dabs or you love having some a good batter, um, check out this peach ring. It's really good. It was really worth it. Thanks again to Sesame Creek Collective for uh, sending that out. Truly do appreciate that. Now I want to talk a little bit about what I use to actually smoke those concentrates. So, as I was saying, I don't do a lot of concentrates. I used to have a quartz the bucket or a quartz bowl that I would have with um, one of my bongs, but I don't know where it wound up. And the reason it's quartz is because it has to, you know, it has to take the high heat. So um, I wound up going to Salzer's Records, which is a local record store here in Ventura. If you're driving through Ventura, like, you know, on the 101 and you want to go to a record store, Salzer's Records, man, they a uh, great record store. They also have a glass shop. And that's where I picked up what's known as a dab straw or a nectar collector. It looks... This is what I picked up. See if you can. So I'm not a big fan of dab straws or nectar collectors because the great thing about um, dab rigs or, you know, bongs that have the right bucket for, for doing dabs is that the water, the percolation, helps keep the, the, the lipids, the fats, and the waxes that may come up with your hit, that may come up with the hit of, of concentrates. It, it keeps them from getting to your mouth, basically. With these dab straws, there's really nothing to stop that. And um, yeah, that those those waxes and, and fats wind up kind of coating the top of my teeth. It wasn't really cool. I didn't really like it. But again, that's because there's no little percolation to, to interrupt that those fats to capture that. So that's just one of the drawbacks of using these dab straws. What, what you would do is you would take your torch and you would slowly... You know, heat the tip, heat the tip, heat the tip, and then when it's hot enough, usually, you know, it says it should be about, you know, 420 degrees, but who would know, right? So you heat the tip, and then you put the hot tip up against the glass container of where your concentrates are. And that heat makes the concentrates evaporate, and you inhale the, the smoke or anything that's evaporating or, 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 you know, just being heated up. But again, um, since there is no percolation to interrupt those waxes and fats coming through, it, you, you wind up, it winds up coating my teeth anyways. So just a word of advice, these are convenient, but um, yeah, they also have a downside. And I like this one better than most because usually most of the dab straws or actual straws are open at the tip. This one has like a little bowl, which makes it cool because you just kind of heat it up, put it up against the dabs and you inhale the smoke but again there's nothing to interrupt it um again that's my take so yeah th that's my take on dab straws um love them or hate them they're there they're convenient but you know pros and cons to everything something else i wanted to mention is i want to give a big shout out and congratulations to justin benton from 101 hemp he just launched his own podcast a couple of weeks ago i believe it's called the miracle plant um, if you have time, you know, you should go check it out. He tells a lot of really great stories about how CBD has affected people's lives positively. Um, yeah, man, it's called The Miracle Plant. Check it out. All right, now let's do the strain of the week. And this week, we're going to talk about the Gorilla Snacks, which the internet says is a cross between the Gorilla Glue Number 4 and the Guinness, which is a Scooby Snacks F3 back crop. And this flower came in at a 23% THC, you know, the flavor and the aroma were like some pine cones, a little, a little spicy, like peppery, with some musk, I don't know, what kind of, some kind of funky musk to it. And at the exhale, it had this really like sweet taste to it, man. It was really good. Now for me, it was a nice, fun, like happy, chatty high, you know, nice and strong. Um, but the only downside was that it really made it hard for me to focus. That's how like, high and, and uh, I don't know, giddy I was with it. Not really giddy, like, ah, 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 but it's just, you know, it was really distracting um, because it was such a fun high, you know. Um, 
Let me see here. This is put together by Soma Rosa. Let's see, Soma Rosa. Good on them. Flower came out real nice. The only downside to it was it was a little dry. It was a little bit dry in the jar. But I mean, other than that, really superb. Hi, man. Right on. That is, again, the Gorilla Snacks. All right. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, there was a question that came across Instagram. And this was from uh, at Lone Star Groves. And his issue is basically that he's having um, some spider mite problems during flowering. Now his question really doesn't tell me how many weeks in flower it is, but he's wondering if there's anything that, that he can spray on his flowering plants to help him fight um, spider mites. And I wrote down a few notes about this. Hopefully it helps not just Lone Star Grows, but anybody else out there who's fighting spider mites in the flower and wondering if, uh, if it's a good idea to spray any kind of foliar spray just to help them fight it. So spider mites, they're a common pest that's easy to miss because um, they don't fly. So, you know, yellow sticky traps, while they do help, you know, just kind of keep the numbers down, they're really not a good way to have have as an indicator as far as how bad the pest pressure is of spider mites in your garden um as i was saying since they don't fly they kind of crawl around sticky traps you know they don't really help you monitor at least don't help me monitor the the, the spider mites very well what does help me monitor spider mites really well is um brush beans what i'll do is i'll 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 plant like some green beans or different brush beans in solo cups or small one gallon containers and I'll put them in my garden because a couple of things will happen. The spider mites are going to be attracted to those brush beans before they're going to be attracted to your cannabis. They're more attracted to the brush beans than they are to your cannabis. So that's going to help me monitor them and it's also going to act as a trap plant. That way, since they are in small containers, when I do think that the press pressure, pressure is too much, I can just take them out and put in a new bean plant. And brush beans, that's all they are. They're just like green bean plants. They're really common. So that's one way that, I, that, that helps me keep down the number of spider mites in my garden. You know, and I don't like spraying any kind of foliar sprays or any kind of moisture on my flowering um, cannabis plants because that added moisture could really help certain molds and funguses really take root and, you know, just cause more problems than they're worth. That's my opinion. That's what I do. Me, I, I always lean towards um, predators, whether it is ladybugs, which are pretty common, you know, pretty easy to get. The thing about ladybugs is that they're seasonal. You can't really get them in the winter time or in the early spring. Yeah, that's the crazy thing about ladybugs. Another thing I like to use for um, spider mites is um, green lacewing eggs or green lacewing larvae. Both of them are really good. Now, you can also get some predator mites. Let me see. Uh, look, I'm not a bug person. I'm going to try to pronounce these other mites that you can get. Let me see. So... Um, one of them is the Pytocialis persimilis, and then the Amblyseus californicus, and then there's also a midge called the Feltina, whoop, let me try that again, Feltiella acarsuga. Wow, I didn't get any of those right. But, you know, those are also some of the predators that you can get that'll help you you know combat the spider mites um, i'm really lucky to have the insectary rincon vitova here near me so these things are pretty available to me um and again it, it, it is a matter of cost also you know a buddy of mine also has a lot of good results he was telling me with using a pyrethrum fog or a pyrethrum fogger but he says he doesn't use it you know, after like week two of flower. And that's mostly because it runs the chance of actually leaving like a residue or a taste on it. And that's what he says. So, um, now the best advice that I can give you when it comes to um, spider mites is basically, you know, tear down your room, clean it top to bottom, you know, close up any kind of holes where the pest may be coming in from. And figure out really how the spider mites got in. 
and how they wound up thriving. I mean, what is it that you have to do to break the chain for them so, you know, you don't keep having this problem? Now, I know some of you or some people may be running, you know, perpetual grows and tearing down a room isn't possible. Um, if you're running a perpetual grow and you, you can't tear down a room, you know what, I I really don't have a lot of, of advice, you know, and other than a fogger, really. Um, because in my mind, you know, the best thing to do is just, you know, empty out a room and clean it from top to bottom. In a perpetual grow, you constantly have to have plants coming in and out of a room that hasn't been completely cleaned. So, you know, yeah, I don't know what to do for if you're running a perpetual grow. Now, I do want to say something about yellow sticky traps. So I, I spoke earlier about sticky traps being good for flying insects. They are. Um, there's also a thing that I do with sticky traps to make them more attractive to certain pests. And that is that I will get a cotton ball and put certain essential oils on the cotton ball and then stick that to the sticky trap, which, you know, makes it more attractive to certain pests. So here are the oils that I use for different pests. Um, cinnamon oil will attract thrips, leaf mineries, and Japanese beetles. Melissa oil will attract fungus gnats, thrips, horse flies, and deer flies. Lemon oil will attract fungus gnats, mealybugs, scale, thrips, and Japanese beetles. And peppermint oil will attract the cucumber beetle. So as I was saying, yeah, I just put like one drop of these essential oils on a piece of cotton ball or a cotton, you know, those little circles that you sometimes get. You know, quarter that, stick it onto the sticky trap, and it'll just make it more appealing to, uh, to those pests, you know. And it also helps me monitor those pest pressures. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, the best advice I can really give is at that point, just harvest as much as you can and clean your room when you're done. All right. Now, let's move on to the report from the Cannabis Frontline. And the first article comes from MRI Simons. It says 25 million Americans used cannabis in the last six months due to COVID pandemic. Starts off, MRI Simons today announced its findings of its national cannabis study. Among its many findings, the study revealed that 10% of all U.S. adults, that's 25 million people, reported that they used cannabis in the past six months due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The study also revealed that these Americans turned to cannabis in a variety of forms, with 55 consuming only marijuana, 35% consuming only CBD, and 11% consuming both. Um... I think I was in the 11%. I consumed both, man. All of it. What else you got? All right, let's see. It also says, um, these COVID cannabis consumers skewered heavily male, 64%, have a medium age of 35, and are 75% more likely than the average adult to be parents with children in the household. In addition, they are educated and more likely to be multicultural. So there you go. Um, in case you were wondering, yeah, I think everybody, or I shouldn't say everybody, I think um, every group, whether age or ethnicity, increased their cannabis use during the pandemic, either because you had time or you had the funds or you were just stressed out and, um, you know, alcohol wasn't a really good idea. Which, you know what, alcohol isn't a good idea anyways, in my opinion. While I do drink some alcohol sometimes, it is not. Uh, the thing of choice for me to help me cope. But anyways. And Mr. Simons has a whole chart of how, you know, demographically it broke down, whether it's median age, male, female, um, um, parents with children in the house. It's a pretty cool article, man. Uh, take a moment and read it. It's, it's a trip the way it came down just on all kinds of lines, man. And the final article comes from the Gondrepreneur. It's titled, DEA Seeking Contractor Who Can Incinerate 8,000 Pounds of Cannabis Per Day. And this was put together by Graham Abbott. Starts off, the Drug Enforcement Administration. Starts off, the Drug Enforcement Administration's Phoenix Division is seeking an Arizona-based contractor capable of incinerating up to 1,000 pounds of cannabis 
and other federally prohibited substances per hour for up to eight hours per day. According to the work description, the incinerator must be capable of incinerating up to a thousand pounds of material and, op and, operate, and operate up to eight hours a day. Additionally, DEA says the contractor would be responsible for burning cardboard boxes, plastics, and many other types of packaging used to transport and sometimes conceal illegal substances. So you have to be able to not just burn the weed and the cocaine and heroin, whatever else but um, plastics and everything else that, that may come with it all, whatever trash is in it. Um, so I wonder, you probably need two different incinerators, I guess. It also says an armed DEA agent would also be present during all scheduled burnings. Employees of the potential contract winner would require drug testing and the DEA would require security camera footage of the entire process. So there you go. On top of um, having to incinerate 8,000 pounds of drugs a day, you also get to have a armed DEA agent. Hey, that's a good time. That's a good thing for your business. So, you know, if you're in Arizona, you have an incinerator business, or you've been looking on a new way to actually, you know, start a new business, become an incinerator for the DEA. And that, brothers and sisters, is the report from the Cannabis Front Line. All right, now I want to get to talking about cannabis and the election. Because, yeah, we had an election Tuesday, um, I think we just found out today, Sunday, or maybe yesterday, at least, I think it was yesterday, that Joe Biden won the presidency. Um, you know, I don't know if Trump conceded already. Uh, yeah, that's not my trip. But there you go, we may have a new president. It's kind of cloudy for me, not sure, haven't checked the headlines. But I do know that um, cannabis won in a big way around the country. Oh, blah, 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 blah. All right. All right, let's start out in Arizona. Arizona had Prop 207. It reads, permits those aged 21 and older to possess up to one ounce of cannabis and permitted to cultivate up to six plants for personal use in a private residence. Those with marijuana convictions are permitted to petition the courts to have their records expunged. Let's see, this um, becomes effective after the voter approved initiative is certified on November 30th, 2020. So... Um, yeah, that sounds like that's going to go into effect at the end of the month, November this year. Let's see, it also says applications for marijuana establishment license start January 19th, 2021 through March 9th, 2021. And will issue licenses no later than 60 days after application submitted. Oh, that's cool. So that means that, uh, you know, the municipality can't just hang on to your application for months at a time. They have to make a decision. It also says expungement. Um, individuals can petition the courts starting July 12th, 2021. So if you're in Arizona, yeah, you can start petitioning the courts out there to either get your, if you're serving time, maybe get resentenced or get whatever conviction you have on your record expunged from your record. So that way you can actually go into the uh, cannabis industry and make some money. Okay, Montana had I-90 or, yeah, I, oh, I'm sorry, Montana had I-190. Which allows adults to possess up to one ounce of marijuana and to cultivate up to four mature plants for personal use. Allows a person currently serving a sentence for an act permitted by I-190 to apply for resentencing or expungement of the conviction. The measure goes into effect January 1, 2020. Let's see, they begin accepting applications for businesses October 1, 2020. And uh, Montana also had I-118, which basically establishes the legal age for drinking and cannabis recreationally. Uh, as 21 years age. As 21 years. So... Next, we've got New Jersey, and they have public question number one. It is a constitutional amendment that legalizes cannabis for personal, non-medical use by adults who are 21 years of age and older. That's awesome. Good for New Jersey. New Jersey just got rec cannabis. Good for them, man. Let's see. Um, it goes into effect January 1, 2020, but it doesn't say... I didn't see anywhere where it said anything about home grows, so um, unclear. 
Now, South Dakota um, had Amendment A, which was a constitutional amendment, allows adults to purchase and possess up to one ounce of marijuana and grow up to three plants for personal use. Goes into effect on July 1, 2020. They also had Measure 26, which establishes a medical marijuana program for patients diagnosed with serious health conditions. It also establishes a system of dispensaries overseen by the Department of Health and requires laboratory testing to ensure product safety. The measure goes into effect July 21, 2021. July 21, 2021. South Dakota got both um, recreational and medical cannabis all in one fell swoop. Now, Mississippi had Initiative 65, which is a constitutional amendment, establishes a state licensing system of dispensers to provide medical cannabis products to qualified patients. This is cool. The measure places no limits on the number of dispensaries and mandates that local municipalities shall not impair the availability of and reasonable access to medical marijuana. The process, oh, the proposal further mandates that state officials begin providing licenses for retail no later than August 15th, 2021. That's pretty cool that they didn't put a limit on the number of licenses for dispensaries. That is very key in having a very strong um, cannabis industry, legal cannabis industry, in my opinion. You know, that is also very key in helping to bring in a lot of the legacy dealers, black market dealers, into the actual legal market. That's awesome. Now, um, so I want to say a little bit about decriminalization as far as decriminalizing drugs. Um, I, I, I had a conversation with Patrick Goggin on episode 126 about just a little bit about the differences between decriminalization and legalization. Um... Because it's a big deal because a couple of states actually and I think and Washington, D.C. have decriminalized drugs and certain, you know, hallucinogenics. Uh, you know, Glenn Greenwald wrote a really good article, a really great article uh, about um, drug decriminalization called Drug Decriminalization in Portugal. It came out like an oh not because Portugal decriminalized all drugs in 01, 2001. Um, and they were one of the first countries to actually do that. Now, Uruguay is a little different. It's not so much that they decriminalized all drugs, but Uruguay um, never really set limits for drug possession. They basically left that up to the judge. You know, if, if someone gets hauled in and there's a question of, of whether they were if they have drugs on them and there's a question of whether they had enough for personal use or were they going to actually do drug trafficking and sell it. Uruguay never set limits for personal use, so they left that to, to the discretion of the judge. So in that sense, yes, drugs are also decriminalized in Uruguay. Now real, now real quick also, um, I notice some people, when they hear the term of decriminalizing all drugs, it gets scary for them. Um, here's really what it means. It's the simplest way that I can put it. Decriminalizing drugs doesn't mean that um, drug trafficking is no longer going to be you know, pursued and people aren't going to be convicted for drug trafficking. That's not what it means. What it means is that small amounts of drugs that people may use for personal use will be taken out of the arena. Will be taken, it's no longer a crime. It's, it's more of a, of, of a fine instead of actually being criminal. And that's a big difference because once it's a, once something is criminal and once you put it on someone's criminal record, it follows them around for a long time. And it really stops them from being able to get certain jobs and move forward in certain jobs and even, you know, get some higher education. So, I mean, taking drug possession for personal use out of this idea that it's a crime of, of criminality is, is a great thing. It's a positive thing in my opinion. So, Oregon passed Measure 110, which decriminalizes the possession and removes criminal penalties for low-level drug possession offenses. And instead, those caught possessing a controlled substance will be subject to a $100 fine and be required to complete a health assessment within 45 days. 
Another thing Oregon got was measure 109, which lets it, which says um, adults will be able to access psychedelics in the medically supervised environment. There aren't any limitations on the types of conditions that would make a patient eligible for the treatment. This, this, this decriminalizes a wide range of what are called ethnogenic substances and plants like um, ayahuasca, ibogaine, and um, some psilocybin mushrooms, you know, they're all considered ethnogenic. Is that what they're called? Is that how you pronounce it? I think so. Now, I think this is a great idea because the more I read about it, the more I, it, it seems like to me one of the really good ways or a really good tool that we can use to help people with PTSD. Now, kind of similar to this, in Washington, D.C., they got Initiative 81, which decriminalizes the possession of a wide range of psychedelics. And use of ethnogenic plants and fungi are going to be among the district's lowest law enforcement priorities. This is in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Again, awesome. I love all of that. That is a really... um, a great way to move forward for it. And if anything, an example for the rest of us to think about how we should, you know, implement or or put into practice. Trying to change this idea of drug addiction and how we can help those people who are addicted to drugs, who do have those chemical hooks, you know, is this, uh, are are ethnogenics one of the ways we can do this with psychedelics? Maybe, you know, for, for sure, from everything I've read, it's a way we can help them with PTSD. But um, yeah, so there you go. That's how cannabis and at the wider sense drugs did in the um, uh, in the election. Well, brothers and sisters, check it out. That's uh, that's all I have to share with you today. That's the end of my notes, man. I want to thank you again for you know taking the time to hang out to watch me do the show from the cab of my truck. You know, um, if you can, you go to patreoncom slash grow. And donate a dollar to this show. That's it. Really inexpensive, a dollar. Um, don't forget to leave a rating and a review of the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Go over to youtube.com slash in my grow show. That's the channel. Subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. I think I already said that, right? I think so. Um, what else? Don't forget, if you're a cannabis company, the most inexpensive and best way to advertise to the cannabis audience at large is to advertise with the In My Grow Show. If you send me an email that is inmygrow at gmail.com, we can absolutely help you do that. Well, everyone, um, I'm going to get on out of here. Weather's moving in. It looks like it might rain. You know, I love you all very much. What else was I going to say? I think that was something else, wasn't there? Other than you know what's coming up. But no, there was... went through all my notes. All right. Um, Yeah. Okay. Remember to always grow, learn, and teach.
Thank you.